I'm Steve from Nearly Wild um, and as you know we've been spending a bit of time talking to nature-based businesses and people who are starting up nature-based businesses and learning a little bit more about what they're doing and some of the stories, some of the experiences of what they've gone through. Um, one of the other things we're really interested in is actually what supports nature-based businesses and some of the other organisations that are involved in what I suppose traditionally would be called the supply chain. Um, and one of the obvious ones is Wildlife Trust. So I'm here today with Gareth. Gareth, do you want to tell us a little bit which Wildlife Trust you're with? Uh, Shropshire Wildlife Trust. Yep. And do you have a particular management role with them? Yes, I'm the North Reserves Officer. So right. I look after about a dozen nature reserves uh, between Shrewsbury and the Welsh borders and the Cheshire border, basically. Interesting. So it, obviously, no, uh, obviously, um, Wildlife Trusts are using a lot of small businesses on their land to help with all the different forms of management and activities that they're doing. And I think it's very easy for us to forget all the little businesses that actually are involved and some of the things they might be involved in doing. So just going to talk to Gareth a little bit about that and, and to some extent we'll see what sort of comes from this because I think it's going to be quite interesting as we develop our thinking. So you thought you were going to have a rest at the end of the working day Gareth. We've just been out and about working and I know you've been hard at work on the strimmer. We're actually right beside a nature reserve here. Um, and it happens to be one of the nature reserves that Gareth works on. And Gareth, I wonder, are there any other um, businesses, small small businesses or pe individuals that work with you, farmers or anybody who's working with you on this reserve? Absolutely, yeah. Um, one of the key elements of managing uh, this particular reserve is grazing, uh, right. keeping open habitats. Yep. And in the past, we've had our own sheep flock for grazing, yep. but... Um, it doesn't really stack up financially to, con to continue with that so we, we've gone down a different road of engaging uh, a contractor basically who's bought his own stock cattle and sheep and he is basically running uh, conservation grazing as a business or trying to run it as a, as a profitable business whilst obviously providing the, the necessary grazing that uh, we want over a, a whole suite of, of different reserves. So when you say conservation grazing I mean what does that mean exactly because obviously there'll be some people who won't have come across that before. Yeah fair, fair enough. Enough, yeah um, I guess what we mean is uh, obviously grazing we're talking about livestock uh, eating herbage putting on weight and then the, the, the animals get eaten and obviously that's the business of, of, of farming uh, by conservation grazing um, the emphasis is much more on how the animals graze to improve the habitat for wildlife mm -hmm. so for example um, what grazing animals do is they they can control scrub so they can keep habitats open by at stopping it and turning to woodland which is obviously if we just walked away for 20 30 years that's what it would do um, but also it's they, they can affect the actual structure of, of, of the sward so what I mean is the the assemblage the, the variety of plants that are growing on the ground and um, the, the different sort of structure in terms of the, the tussockiness, bare areas, all that sort of thing. Different grazing animals will produce different uh, qualities of that structure and that variety of plants. So according to what you we're trying to manage for and what we want you know, on our nature reserve, we will select grazing animals um, for, that, for that end. Interesting. So, so, yeah. that's, <coughs> so that's really what I mean by conservation grazing. The emphasis is very much on the, the, the effect on the habitat. Right. But obviously what we're trying to do now is to, is to marry it and integrate it much more with farming, much more with, with somebody running it as a business in order to make the whole thing economically sustainable. So he actually will, as well as working for you and presumably they, then they get paid a small amount for grazing the land, yeah. um, they then also will be able to grow the, the animals on and they'll be selling those animals at some point in the future put at the market or whatever absolutely absolutely and and um, of course you know it, the, what, another added advantage of that is there's people that buy that final product they're buying you know a quality product it's pasture reared it's not been you know reared indoors in an intensive situation where they've been stuffed full of you know hormones and everything else so it, it, it's a quality product um, and also people are supporting nature conservation as well by buying that product so it's a sort of win-win situation really interesting well, we hope at another point to have have a chat with um, some of the people involved in this conservation grazing and, and, and learn more about what they do and how they work it. Um, but I'm also aware that within some of your reserve work, as well as the working with the conservation graziers, you're also working with other farms. So mm. there's one particular one I, I know locally um, who we'll be talking to in another interview, Ian mm. at Trevlack Farm. Yeah. What exactly are they doing with you? Um, 
there was a couple of things really. Um, if I can just step back a bit and sort mm. of talk a little bit about the wider context of what Shropshire Wildlife Trust interest is in farming in Shropshire. Um, studies and research have shown that uh, when we compare um, what the, 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 the fortunes of plants, if you like, over, over many decades, um, that plants uh, have declined in, in, in large parts of the county. Right. And by far and away, the biggest decline is in the farmland um, as opposed to woodland and, and other types of habitat. So it, there's no point us just, you know, as a wildlife trust, just managing our little nature reserves in isolation and totally ignoring what's going on in the much, much bigger, wider countryside, mm. most of which in Shropshire is, is farmland. Um, so we're very keen to, to try and influence that where we can and one of the best ways we can do that is where we find a farmer who perhaps uh, wants to do things a bit differently, um, we, we do our utmost to support that farmer right, and then champion right. them and hopefully then encourage other farmers to go along similar lines. So specifically with Ian, uh, some of my colleagues that work with um, wetland um, areas and have had funding uh, for wetland projects, they've helped Ian uh, improve the quality of his water courses and, and the wetland on the farm. Um, I've taken some of our volunteers that, that come and, and help us manage the nature reserves onto the farm. We've done some um, clearance of some of the dense holly understory in, in, in Bluebell Wood on, mm -hmm. on Trablack Farm. So we've supported him that way. Um, a way Ian supported us is we have a small nature reserve a site of special scientific interest uh, adjacent to Trevelock Farm, Sweeney Fen. Um, we cut a part of the fen each year as part of the, the management. Um, removing that cut vegetation, taking it away, is, can be quite costly. So we've been actually spreading it on Ian's land uh, with Ian's permission, which is, is an is a easy way of us getting rid of that material but also we're hoping that some of the, the seed from the, uh, those plants that we're spreading will start to establish uh, uh, on Ian's land and we can again increase the area that some of these rare plants uh, have got to actually survive and hopefully flourish. Interesting so there's quite a close working relationship there with the um, with the farm business and, yeah. and the wildlife trust. Um, I know as well that Ian's unusual as a farmer because he also has some uh, meat processing um, in that he makes pies and, yes. and, and sells those in, in local shops and, and a long way beyond as well, I think even down yeah. in London and places. That's right. Um, so are you involved, is the Wildlife Trust involved in that in any way as well? Not at the moment. We, we, we did have discussions about, uh, this is when we owned our own Hebridean sheep, right. and we did have discussions about um, working with Ian and actually um, starting to breed the sheep and, and the, the lambs going into pies because mm -hmm. um, as you say Ian's got an on-site bakery uh, most of the products are sold wholesale uh, in London but um, th but there's a local market as well and yeah we, d we did discuss the Id ideas with him about possibly um, selling the pies again with the sort of wildlife trust you know conservation grazing sort of stamp on it um, we then, we then, we we haven't completely gone away from that, but because of the the, the wider change in in what we were doing in the county with grazing and engaging this, this chap, and, and as I've discussed before, um, that's sort of gone off gone off the radar for the right, time being. Should right. we say? Personally, I'm keen that, that we that we revisit that at some point because I, I'm keen on on the notion of of, of the living landscape. Mm -hmm. So the Oswestry Hills, where we are at the moment, we've got seven nature reserves. There's a an abundance of local wildlife sites. It's, it's, it's rich in, in wildlife, it's rich in, in uh, industrial archaeology, it's rich in, in fa fabulous views and landscapes. Um, but, the, but the idea of it being a living landscape means it's, it's not, it shouldn't be a museum piece. Mm. You know, it should be the management that goes into the wildlife sites and into the nature reserves hopefully should be part of the local economy. So again, if we have you know, animals grazing the reserves, grazing the local wildlife sites, it would be great if, you know, that, that was brought within the umbrella of farming and, and, you know, a farmer was making money out of that. Absolutely. So That's yeah. interesting. I mean, this whole thing to do with the green supply chain, and you can, you, you're starting to hear already how um, Gareth's work and the work of the Wildlife Trust is, is influencing, supporting, developing those green supply chains. And um, in other areas, there are examples similar to the one that um, Gareth's been talking about, where um, the meat from uh, reserves, the animals from reserves is going into local meat production, pie, mm. so on. Um, so uh, I think we're gonna see more and more of this, and certainly even from my own land, um, where I run conservation grazing, very much working actually with the advice of, um, of Gareth, um, then I've 
had some of my meat go to Trevlac Farm to um, then be turned into pie. So, so actually it becomes a lot more complex than just one person's interaction. Um, in, in relation to the reserves, I mean, I know the local reserve here, there's also woodland um, mm. and some forestry trees uh, in amongst that, plantation trees, as well as a, a, a sort of older remnant woodland. Mm. Um, so uh, do you have any involvement there with, the, with wood production? Is there, any, is there anybody involved in cutting or anything like that? Yep, um, on our Clunkless Common, which is our largest reserve in the area, um, we've got a, a, a relationship with a local uh, firewood contractor. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, we've, we've got an agreement with him where he is um, coppicing um, parts of the woodland on Clunkless Common for us. Um, so in other words, felling trees and the products go into his firewood business, basically. Right. So we don't pay him uh, for what he does, but we are getting um, the restoration of, of woodland coppice basically which will be a, a much much uh, richer wildlife habitat in, in a few years to come um, and obviously he's getting an income from the wood for his firewood business so again it, it's a win-win situation there's no money involved it's 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 providing a, a employment opportunity for a local contractor which is of benefit to, to our desires and needs in terms of the management. Absolutely. I mean, uh, there's other people I'm aware of, and just thinking about some of the countryside skills, and I'm not sure, because we haven't really spoken about this before, but how many of them um, actually end up working, I suppose, with wildlife trusts and wildlife trust mm. land. I mean, do you have um, anybody like hedge layers or, or um, any of the other forms of sort of more agricultural, traditional agricultural practice um, that could be seen as being probably part of the green supply chain? Uh, we do um, certainly, and in fact, the the the, uh, the the chap I mentioned who's been doing the uh, the, the copper thing for us, uh, he's also a, a professional hedge layer. Right. Um, so yes, we're. Um a lot of our hedge laying at the moment, we, we, we do just with our volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't win any awards, um, but you know, myself and my colleagues are competent enough. And to be honest, we, we've got experienced volunteers that have been with us many years that have, have been hedge laying that are, are really very, very skilled anyway. Um, so, so most of our hedge laying uh, we, we do internally um, with our volunteers. Um, again, I would always look for opportunities where, you know, if, if we've got funding available to, to, to pay a, a, you know, a local person um, to lay a hedge or ideally um, put on training courses. Well, I was uh, going to come on to that yeah. actually, Gareth, because was it strikes me that's another quite key area in terms of um, the, the sort of green nature-based economy, that there must be people who are doing hedge laying training mm. and felling training and all these other things, even mm. teaching grazing. I mean. Um, are, are, there, are there local trainers that you're using for those sorts of things? Um, off and on, yes. Uh, again, it would, be, it would be great to, to, to do more of that. Um, certainly I know locally um, some of the people that are doing commercial hedge laying, um, which I would very much rate as a, as a nature-based business. I mean, they're, they're ensuring um, that, that, in this case, a linear woodland is maintained. It's being kept because if it wasn't being layered, then many of those trees would grow out. So the, the branch would grow up and the stem would be left, um, which is great if you want a row of trees, but all of that sort of woodland-based scrub habitat that the hedge creates would be gone. So the hedge laying is an important, playing an important role there in maintaining those habitats. In the, in the Wildlife Trust, there's quite a lot of um, existing knowledge and a lot of expertise because that's why they, they employ people like Gareth. Um, but there are specialisms that sometimes will bring people in, either who are very keen volunteers, some of whom actually used to have an nature based business, or people who are running a business of their own. So people that are coming to my mind, Gareth, that you may have some involvement with periodically, people doing things like bat surveys or okay. um, botanical specialist botanical surveys, um, moth surveys. I mean, are, are there any of those sorts of people who are involved where occasionally you have to bring them in for a project or an activity working with your land? Definitely, yeah. Um, again, uh, I mean, if we're talking about sort of consultants, yeah. then um, obviously we need to have the funding in place. Mm -hmm. And by and large, we, we've only got money if we've if we've got a secured a, a project. Yeah. Most of our funding is project based, which um, it is, is fine, is good. Um, but obviously, the, the big thing with with anything that's project based is making sure you know it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be putting five years worth of money and effort into something and then at the end of the project it all just just drifts, drifts away that's largely probably no good to anyone um, so so we would bring in 
uh, people to do bat surveys, to do you know um, dormouse surveys. Um, obviously, these these things require not only um, specialist knowledge and skills, but it, but very often involves having somebody who's got a license. Right. You know, if we're talking about um, you know obviously protect you know protected species. But I think. Um that's really interesting getting a little bit of an insight into some of the mm. types of businesses that you work with. Just off the top of your head, any, any others that come into your mind as we've been talking? Um, I, I guess that the ones, um, again, thinking about here, Clanamat Rocks, uh, sort of based a bit more around uh, activities mm -hmm. and adventure. Um, so, for example, people running outdoor activities, whether it's climbing, uh, bushcraft. Yep. Um, again, they are obviously looking for venues, looking for sites to do to do those activities, um, and and we very often have got some some very very good, um, very very suitable venues. Um, so it's not necessarily about directly about the management of the reserve. It's about what the reserve can offer really as, as a venue and as, as as a place for exploration. Interesting. Um, yeah. The other thing, I suppose it's not technically a nature-based business, but uh, I know other, other wildlife trusts and other organisations like the National Trust have been very successful working with the, with the film and television industry, right. again in terms of providing a location. Not necessarily a nature-based business, but it's, it's part of that business, it's because of the nature that's there. Absolutely, so, and, yeah. and potentially also, I think often those organisations do pay a small amount for the use of the venue, yes. um, sometimes a larger amount for the use of the venue, yeah. um, and that can be really important in actually sustaining mm. some of the other activities of the, of the Wildlife Trust or mm. of the landowner, um, but also, as you were saying, a little bit like the project money, if there's money available in the budget, then you can mm. afford to do some of the other activities, which means some of the downstream suppliers, the, the true nature-based businesses, are actually mm. then being able to get involved. So, yeah. it's, it's it's quite a complicated web that we weave that um, is is part of quite a large green economy which I think is often not so well understood. We sort of think of the charity is doing X or Y and in fact it is but it's also doing it by supporting local businesses that are actually the suppliers and the doers of, of much of that work and, and many of the opportunities mm. that are developing. Mm. That's been really interesting, Gareth. Thanks very much for your time. Um, I'm sure we'll end up with having another chat at a future point and potentially maybe even go and look at some of these places and talk to some of the suppliers. Thanks very much, Gareth. You can go and have your cup of tea now. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, subscribe. If you didn't like it, leave a reason in the comments as to why.